Shalom Aleichem, everyone. Uh, welcome back for another unexpected video. Um, our good friend, Scott Wolf, has a question. He asks, fortunately, I don't have his question immediately in front of me, but he asks, basically, uh, what do we do when people say that the Kurbanos, the, uh, the sacrifices in the base of Mikdash, that these were abolished, nullified, um, rendered obsolete, you know, something to this effect, well, first, let's try to remember where these people are getting these ideas from. They say that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that it was, uh, a, it was a final solution, in a sense. It was a solution to sin, and he, he's the eternal sacrifice, and um, you know, returning to sin is like crucifying him all over again, rendering his sacrifice... Um, undone or something to that effect, uh, based on the words of Paul. And usually the main source for this idea that uh, Jesus' death was a sacrifice for sin comes from the book of Hebrews, which is not written by Paul, but it is, has some connections with some ideas that he taught. Um, it's possible that the author of Hebrews and Paul both had studied Kabbalah or uh, early mystical schools of thought at that time, which were technically not Kabbalah, but uh, were related. There's the Hekalot literature and uh, other mystical schools of thought at that time. And basically, there is a, a passage in the book of Hebrews that says that the priesthood has been... What? Has been abolished. Or has been uh, nullified or has been made obsolete. The Greek word there actually means something to the extent of, of being transferred or exchanged or moved to a different spot. And usually Christian theologians will see this and they'll say, oh, it was put aside. It wasn't simply transferred to a different area. It was, it was put aside. It was thrown away. It was thrown in the garbage. Chas and so we can understand that there is a, a hardcore translation bias in favor of the traditional Pauline, Augustinian, Catholic belief system here, that the sacrifices were done away with, and the only true sacrifices are prayer and the Eucharist, in which we consume as cannibals the flesh of the Christos. And of course, as, as Jews and insensible messianics, we don't believe that. And so, how do we respond to the idea that the Corbanos have been done away with? First, we can understand that the priesthood has not been abolished. That, in fact, nothing has been abolished. Hashem says dozens of times throughout the Holy Torah that the Torah is forever. And then some will say, well, the sacrifices were added later, they weren't part of the original Torah. And th this simply isn't true. When you go and read the text of the Torah, you can't help but see that these korbanos are, are intertwined with everything else. There is not, you know, a special book called Sacrifices that was delivered, you know, decades or hundreds of years after the Torah. It was delivered at the same place that the rest of the laws were given at the same time that they were given, by the same, you know, God, the same Hashem that gave the rest of the Torah. And, you know, they'll say, oh, well, because they were given in this context or because they were given in this circumstance because of the um, the worshiping the Egel Zahav, the golden calf, that because of the sin, the sacrifices were added. And this simply isn't the case we see that sacrifices actually predate the Torah. So even if they were part of the Torah system, the Torah system, God forbid, were to be abolished, the sacrifices would actually still be maintained. We see that Cain and Avil, that they offered sacrifices to Hashem. They were the children of Adam, of Adam and Rishon. Where did they learn this from? Did they invent this? Where did they acquire this knowledge from? Really? The Tanakh never says. 
So either they they both agreed to invent something and then Kain felt like the sore loser, or Adam Arishain had learned it from Hashem and then taught his own children. And this is actually what happened. We also see that after the great flood, that Noah gets off the how was it off of the off the ship, uh, off the ark, and he offers sacrifices. Right? Where did he learn this from? Did he open up his NIV or King James version of the Torah and say, "Well, it says right here"? No. He didn't have any Torah. He didn't even have the original Torah from Har Sinai. What he did was he had the tradition, an oral tradition, passed down from Adam to his sons, to his sons, to his sons, to, what is it, I think nine or ten generations, until you get to Noah. So it was passed down as an oral tradition all the way to Noah, and Noah passed it down to his sons, and then eventually it came to Avram Avinu, and when Abraham got a hold of this knowledge, he and his children were observing this practice, offering sacrifices to Hashem, and this made its way into the entire Jewish nation, or all of the Israelites. And so when Hashem commands the offering of sacrifices, this is not something new to the Jewish nation. This is not something like, oh my gosh, like what on earth are we killing animals for? We have to call PETA because this is unethical. You know, this is, it's, of course you're going to offer sacrifices. What else are you going to be doing? Now, of course, throughout Jewish history, these sacrifices have taken on an ethical dimension, a spiritual dimension, a even mystical dimension. And it says, even in the Talmud and the Midrashim, that there was miracles happening in the temple because of the dust on the floor. And this is why the Kohanim and the, the Levites, they'd walk barefoot in the temple so that they could connect with even just the dust of the temple. And they wanted that greater bond with Hashem because they know that the, the Shekhinah, the, the presence of God, infused the very stones of the temple. Now, does this mean they worship the temple because you know, God's presence is in the, the dead matter? No. That's idolatry. That's the Vedazara. You know, the ancients never worshipped the idol itself. They always worshipped the power, the spirit, the deity, the genie, the angel, anything that was inside of that statue. They were bowing down to the power inside of it. Now, does anybody worship the temple? No, you go inside to perform your duties. And these duties were given by Hashem to Adam Harishwin, to the very first man. It was a practice continued by his righteous ancestors. And it continued, and it was reestablished as a new covenant at Mount Sinai, right? When Hashem verified the validity of this practice. And in fact, he added onto it. Because... Initially, you could perform sacrifices basically in any way that you liked, wherever you liked, at any time that you liked. And Hashem says, because this is such a good thing, we want to save this practice, let's regulate it a little bit so that we can do it in a better way, we can improve the process, and that we can maintain that it is perpetually observed forever, as long as there's a temple. And so this is why he commanded the sacrifices in the first place. So we recognize that these are from God, no? If God did not accept these, why would he send fire from heaven to ignite the, the altars in the temple? Is that not validation? Otherwise, we have to ask ourselves, you know, who else is sending the fire? Oh, it's an illusion from Satan. No, it's not an illusion from Satan. This is validation from God. So again, how do we how do we talk to these people who say the sacrifices are done away with because of Jesus? Okay. So first we can appeal to the actual text of the Tanakh. We can look at the dozens of times in the Tanakh that say that the entire Torah is eternal, 
It's perpetual. It's everlasting. You shall observe it throughout your generations. Right? Language used like this. There's also language specifically used of the sacrifices themselves. That the descendants of Aaron would offer these as a perpetual ordinance throughout their generations, and it is an eternal covenant, language like this, to show the perpetuity of the offerings. Even in the New Testament itself, the so-called New Testament, we find that Jesus is telling his followers how to conduct themselves when they're offering sacrifices. He never says, don't do that, you don't need to anymore because I'm about to die here in a few minutes and you won't need to. Rather, he says, based on the assumption that they're going to be doing it, when you go to offer a sacrifice, you have to, if you remember that you wronged somebody, go make right with them first. And then come back and finish the business. He never says, go make right with them and then, and then stay out there. He says, come back and finish the business when you're done. Make right with your neighbor and then come perform your sacrifices. He never condemned him. Number two. Actually, that was number two. Number th So the first one is sources in the Tanakh saying it's eternal. Second one, Jesus himself teaches people how to properly offer sacrifice, literal sacrifices, the slaughtering of animals in the temple. Number three, Jesus never taught that he was a sacrifice, and he never said that his death abolished the sacrifices in the temple. So, so far, we're left with nothing. You know, he's continuing the Judaic system that was already in place at that time. Number four, Paul never says that sacrifices were abolished. Did you know that? He never says it. Number five, the apostles and the disciples in Jerusalem, when Paul comes to the town, they tell him, look, there's these rumors that you're breaking the Torah. I believe that this is, what, Acts 21, I believe? He says that there's rumors going around, Paul, that you're breaking the Torah. To show that these rumors are nothing, go complete a Nazarite vow with these other guys and pay for their expenses. So it's bad enough from a Christian perspective that he has to go offer these sacrifices. What makes it even worse is that he now has to go pay for all, for all of his friends, you know? And, you know, who are these people? These four other men, they weren't just local Jews hanging out with the Nazarenes. These were followers of Jesus who were offering sacrifices in the temple, who were completing their time as Nazarites. Because there was an early tradition in the, among the followers of Jesus, and even in the early church, the early Gentile church, that Jesus himself was a Nazarite. Not just a Nazarene from Nazareth, but that he was a Nazarite. And that's why often he's depicted with long hair, because of this mistaken belief based on a faulty translation. It's not to say that that uh, this tradition never actually happened. Maybe he actually was a Nazarite. But based on the text itself, we don't really have much of a basis for that belief. Um, we also find him turning water to wine. So uh, to think that he didn't taste test that is a little bit unbelievable in my book. Um, my book called Second Opinions. <laughs> so what was that? Reason number five, that James commands Paul and these four other Nazarenes to go offer sacrifices. Number six, the book of Hebrews never says that the priesthood is abolished or that the sacrifices were abolished. It says that with the coming destruction of the temple, those services will be moved and transferred to heaven until the temple can be rebuilt. This is why Jesus, in the eyes of the author, has to be a different type of priest because if he was a Levite, he would only be qualified to be serving as a priest in the earthly temple. But he's not. He even says, for Moses said nothing concerning the priesthood, 
to the tribe of Judah, but only to Levi. And so, you know, the Nazarenes were trying to struggle with this idea, saying, we know that, that Jesus is an intermediary figure, and he's interceding on our behalf because this is indeed the job of a tzaddik, that he is a, a non-essential mediator in a sense. In other words, he's there to help, but not inhibit. We always have a direct connection with Hashem, but, you know, if Hashem is ignoring us because of our own sins, this person can, in a sense, schmooze with Hashem and... Of course, I'm speaking in the language of man. Schmooze with Hashem and get on his good side and say, look, Jonathan, David, Paul, Rachel, you know, whoever the person is, they're really good people. You know, they mean well. They, they're just struggling. Yes, Am Yisrael has a lot of sins, but please listen to their prayers. Hear their voice. And if not them, hear my voice. Matzadik, you know, not me actually, but you know, the Tzadik is saying this. Matzadik, please hear my voice, Hashem. You promised that everybody who calls on you sincerely, you will hear. I'm calling on you sincerely, hear my voice. And in this sense, the person becomes the the top mediator, the top intercessor for Am Yisrael. And so in a metaphorical sense, Whoever intercedes for somebody else is like a priest, because this was part of the jobs of the priests in the temple. The greatest intercessor then becomes the greatest priest, or the high priest. And so when this temple system, in a sense, is moved to heaven, because once the temple's destroyed, where else are you going to put it? If you can only have it in Jerusalem, and the Romans just completely raised the city to the foundation, renamed it Aelia Capitolina, and renamed all of Judea Palestine. Yes, that's where the name Palestine comes from, is when the Romans took over. When they've completely destroyed Jerusalem, how are you going to have sacrifices in Jerusalem? That's the problem. And so the author of Hebrews says that because the temple is going to be destroyed, these, in a sense, were moved up to heaven. Not literally, right? There's not literal sacrifices going on in heaven. Right? The incense that was offered on earth is symbolic of the incense in heaven. The incense is a prayer. And this is something that we find even in rabbinic literature as well. And the sacrifices, Paul says that he offers his own Gentile students as a sacrifice to God. Was he murdering them and slitting their throats Saying, Boruch Hashem. No. I don't think so anyway. <laughs> um, you know, in, I believe it's Hosea, it says that, you know, may the, the words of my lips be like fatted calves. Um, may they be a sacrifices. There's plenty of examples of this, actually. And so the services in heaven are not like the services on earth. But they're accomplishing the same goals, and really, they accomplish them better than what they could down here. Now, with that said, the temple system on earth is still necessary, and we still need to build the base of Mikdash quickly in our days, please, Hashem. But when we don't have it, then what's our only alternative? Our only alternative is to rely on the system in heaven as the backup. Right? Both systems need to be working together. Because just as there was the tabernacle in heaven that Hashem showed to Moshe Rabbeinu and said, build the earthly tabernacle like this, there's also the heavenly temple after which the earthly temple was modeled. And so when you're, when you're missing that image on earth, it loses its counterpart. And it's not that it's bad, it's simply deficient. It's simply not ideal. So, anyway, I hope that this answers your question. Hopefully we can convince Christians that we don't necessarily need a, um, a dead person to die for our sins and therefore abolish the temple sacrifices. So let's see if I can remember all six of these because I'm, I'm going off the top of my head. There's examples from the Tanakh that say that the Torah is eternal and the, the sacrifices are eternal. 
there is Jesus commanding his followers to um, make amends with people before they offer the sacrifices. There is, let's see, <laughs> there's uh, Jesus never abolishing sacrifices in his teachings in the Gospels. Paul never abolishes them in his own epistles. Um, the book of Hebrews is talking about a transference of the priesthood from earth to heaven, not an abolition of the priesthood. And then I think there was one other one, which hopefully you guys remember better than I do. Anyways, I hope everybody is doing well. Hopefully that answers some questions for everybody. And um, take care. We'll see you later.